Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, so in this uh, session before lunch, we'll have uh, two talks, one here and one from far away. Uh, so Mika has come from far away uh, to tell us about open problems that have baffled Tony so far, I guess. So I think that so far is probably important. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, hello all. Um, so I was really racking my brain about what to talk about in, in this uh, kind of non-standard meeting. Um, so I thought it's, it's an excellent opportunity to take stock um, of my PhD with Tony and like revisit some of the things that uh, were left over, the things we didn't solve, uh, are failures, if you want. Um, so I sat down, I tried to think, what were the things we really wanted to prove we couldn't? And I couldn't really come up with many problems. And it's not like we solved everything we ever wanted. It's more, I think it's a feature of the mind that it kind of blocks uh, <laughs> traumatic experiences. Um, so, uh, so luckily I found this like an old document of open problems. So I haven't touched this for like five years and already like I'm flooded with uh, uh, traumatic uh, experiences. <laughs> so, so there's one incident here um, where we, uh, we thought we had a, Exponential law about for cutting planes against Titan it was with Tony okay. <laughs> and uh, I guess Robert and Noah also in the room. Um, just you know, we had a manuscript ready, but just days before submission, we realized that there's a massive hole at the very foundation of the proof. It's incorrigible, and turns out, yes, you probably know this is not even true. It's like there are upper bounds, surprising upper bounds, as we have found by other researchers the next year. So the upper bounds are actually best paper at CCC. So we failed. Um, but okay, so there are loads of web props. I can only talk about a few of them. So I, I decided I'll uh, choose um, a kind of a theme um, which I had a lot during my uh, PhD, which was a kind of an interplay between structural complexity theory and uh, concrete complexity. So here's a picture of, from one of my papers on uh, structural relationships in communication complexity. It's a kind of an intimidating diagram, but just wait for a few slides and I'll. Uh, overwhelm you even more. Um, so, so the general idea is that we have our fantastic uh, classical Turing machine complexity classes. Um, we can't really separate anything, but what you can do is you can study their like circuit analogs or query complexity analogs, uh, which are usually done for the purposes of giving at least oracle separations between the classes. So it's a general template. Um, and um, I want to kind of so a few open problems uh, from this perspective. So of course, oracle separations are like a classical hobby uh, from uh, the seventies. So let's see what we can still do uh, about this uh, today. So let me kind of explain this correspondence between Turing machine classes and these uh, query analogs. So maybe the most, the simplest cor correspondence is just, okay, P stands for uh, polynomial time, we compute efficiently. In the land of query complexity and, and circuits, um, we take this to mean um, shallow decision tree. So where I say an n-bit Boolean function is uh, like efficiently computable deterministically if there's a poly log n depth um, uh, decision tree for it. Um, so that's like the first correspondence. You can do it for any class you uh, choose to pick. So maybe BPP um, gives you randomized uh, decision trees. NP corresponds to low width DNF. So if you have an Boolean function that admits a low width DNF, it's like the yes inputs admit short certificates that, that they're uh, yes inputs. You can go up the polynomial hierarchy. So um, the second level, for example, would correspond to uh, depth three circuits with an OR gate at the top, and I suppose polylog fanning at the bottom. And so these are kind of circuit models we can prove lower bounds for. They're concrete models of computation. Another way of defining them, if you want, is to you can just fix a complete problem. So for NP, for example, the complete problem would just be the OR function on N bits. And um, you could ask like, which Boolean functions reduce to computing OR under shallow decision tree reductions? So you could ask what, what class of functions can I compute as an OR of a bunch of uh, shallow decision trees? Okay, that's exactly low with DNFs is, is, is the model. Um, okay, so these are all like classical correspondences. We can have you know, been doing this for ever. So are there any kind of separation questions that are open? Uh, um, 
about these like basic uh, circuit models. How would we how would I go about finding <laughs> open oracle separation problems? So one way of doing this, let's see, is to go on complexity zoo. There's a complexity zoo diagram here. Um, uh, if I browse a little bit, so, so here it's a very useful like active diagram. You can click on classes and see what's known about them. Uh, here I've highlighted in particular one class, ZPP to the NP. It's another class below it called S2P for symmetric alternation. Probably very few people have heard about this, but what this diagram is saying, the S2P class is gray. It means we don't know whether this class is contained in this one. There's an inclusion one way, we don't know of an inclusion another way. Um, so this was actually one of the things we, um, uh, uh, did studies okay this the inclusion in one way is an you know, old result uh, a non-trivial one and it begs the question like can you separate these two classes in the other direction relative to an oracle um i'm not actually going to define <laughs> the classes too much they're a little bit esoteric but you know we're naive uh, grad students so it seems interesting and so back in toronto i was uh, one day discussing this question with uh, Tom Watson, uh, who was a postdoc at the time. They collaborated with him a lot. Um, so you can imagine the scene like in the Toronto Theory Lab. Uh, we'll hunch over this, this whiteboard. And I actually do help you a little bit. I, I didn't look like this back then. So that's a lie. It's more like this. So a few hair. And uh, we consulted with Tony uh, about this question. I don't know if Tony remembers this at all, but I certainly do. So Tony said, uh, I don't think you want to hear this. Do you, do you remember what he said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you said, if I really remember, I think you will solve it, but I don't think you should spend time on it. I think not important enough. Um, so with the hindsight of like eight years, can report that like both of these are false in the sense that I still haven't solved it and uh, I'm still uh, wasting time on this. And um, I mean, it's even worse. Not only am I wasting time, but I'm like asking people uh, to solve it for me. Um, in fact, I'm doing it right now. So <laughs> I still hear about an approach to this problem. You know, the approach is almost more interesting than the application. So um, uh, I think there's a payoff at the end. Um, so my approach, oh, by the way, so it's not just a random oracle separation. People do care about it. There's a recent survey of the few like remaining oracle separations. You could hope to still prove with a modification of the techniques we have. So Lance Fortner has a, has a survey and then he does mention uh, this very problem. Um, but okay, let me tell you uh, like uh, an approach to this. It's a, it's a circuit complexity puzzle I want you to solve. Um, so there's a very old uh, oracle separation result by Santa showing that um, you can't do something called approximate counting in the, the second level of the polynomial hierarchy, so the sigma 2p. Um, so it's a circuit lower bound. What does it actually say in, in, in detail? Um, so it says that uh, you need exponential size depth three circuits for the following problem. So I should say it's important that we're looking at an OR gate at the top and there's a polylog uh, fat at the bottom. So these circuits they should not be able to do approximate counting of the Hamming weight of the input. So if I give you an n-bit string, and you have to distinguish between whether the Hamming weight is at least root n or at most half root n. So there's like a constant factor gap in these two cases. So it's a partial promise problem. Um, and what's interesting about his proof is that um, it's proved using what's called a top-down method. So you know, here's the depth three circuit you want to prove a lower bound for. As I promised, there's an OR gate at the top. So you can think of the circuit as an OR of CNFs, CNFs of low width. <coughs> and Santa shows for this function, you can sort of start analyzing a hypothetical depth three circuits from the top gate. And essentially, you know, find a contradiction uh, further down. That if the circuit is too small, you can't, uh, compute this uh, approximate counting problem. So this Santa's result is, is actually not a very well-known result, I don't think, but it's very interesting because it's one of the few circuit lower bounds for which 
we don't have a bottom-up proof. So bottom-up meaning you know, starting to analyze from the inputs. So think of a random restriction method, so switching lemmas. Uh, so, so we lack such a proof. And I think it could only supply me a bottom-up proof of this old result uh, we'd be in business. And that would maybe solve the Oracle suppression question. So that's my question. But I actually have an even approach to uh, um, a bottom-up proof. So what do you have to prove uh, uh, to get a bottom-up proof? So I have a, a variation of a switching lemma. Uh, actually, I advertised this just a few weeks ago at Darkstool. So I call it, kind of call it the half switching lemma. Should be easy to prove, uh, maybe by the end of the workshop, please. Uh, <laughs> so let me just first recall quickly, what does a, a usual switching lemma say? So if you start with um, uh, a low width uh, CNF and you hit it with a restriction. So um, I guess I'm looking at the restriction that leaves unset, let's say some like root n number of variables. So the stars are really like randomly chosen amongst the variables. And then for the rest of the variables, you just put in zeros and ones 50-50. So switching lemma and Hostad says that if you perform this restriction, then you're left with just a shallow decision tree. Um, okay, so this is classical stuff. Um, I guess, you know, good fraction of us has proved or, or used uh, um, such methods. What I want to, I want a variation of this now. I, I say, what happens actually if I only half restrict it? So I, I don't put in both zeros and ones. I just put in zeros. So still I choose some root n variables to leave unset at random, but the remaining I set to zeros. So what happens? This is, uh, this is my like half restriction. So what happens? What does the, what happens to the CNF? What kind of property does it gain uh, from the restriction? So actually, let me ask, like, what candidates for such a property? What do you think happens to your CNF? Especially people who I haven't asked this before. So some candidates, I've, like when I put this to Avi Victor one day, also Robert, just nothing happens. Uh, you know, you didn't like uh, have a random enough restriction, but that's wrong. Something does happen, and I can prove it to you right now that something happens, which is uh, it's a kind of a trick. Like, what if I further restrict the formula? So now I put in mostly ones and leave some variable still unset. Well, the composition of these two types of restriction is one of the things that uh, Hostart has considered, and we know under that sort of restriction, you do get a shallow decision tree. So somehow a property X could be, if I further restrict the formula, I get a shallow decision. That's an ugly property, but it's something. So I'm asking you again, like <laughs> something's happening, but give me like a good semi property. Um, something like syntactic about the, the function. Uh, that's like not the cheating property I just mentioned. Yes. So I put mostly zeros and I put mostly ones. And these are the types of restrictions that Horst start considered to, to prove lower bounds for these types of functions. So maybe, you know, I don't do quite 50, 50 ones and zeros, but they're one plus, you know. Yeah. Okay, so I don't have a, like a, I have some ideas what this property could be. Um, actually asked this of Hostad at the workshop. So here's one thing that like, um, is my conjecture is that maybe the property is that after restriction, the function you have is such that uh, you look at it's one certificate. So like partial assignments that force the function to be true, then those certificates don't feature many ones. If you think back like why this would suffice to prove, like give a bottom up proof for this uh, impossibility of approximate counting. Because after you restrict here, the approximate counting problem now asks you to sort of distinguish between all ones versus half ones. So a structural property like this would, would give the, um, the thing I wanted. And actually, I think this switching limit is more interesting than the original application uh, itself. So I, yeah, this is like the, the payoff you 
you get when you explore very uh, esoteric looking questions. So Tony, can, can I have your permission to work on, it, work on this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's open, but uh, it should not be the people who do switching numbers. Maybe you can tell me how to do it. Okay, so that was maybe you know, one, one line in my file. Um, let's browse a little bit more. What else do we have? Um, we have 15 minutes almost. So let me, uh, let me look at something else. It's like in the similar theme, looking at uh, low depth circuits or uh, low levels of the polynomial hierarchy. So okay, in, in, in classical um, complexity theory, we have this like two big, you know, for any complexity class, it's big distinction. Am I looking at a class that's syntactic or semantic? <laughs> So um, let's say syntactic by definition means that the class has complete problems. So our usual class is P and P. Um, so there are loads, but are more, there are also interesting classes that don't seem to have complete problems. So it's some, somehow the definition of the class involves some sort of a promise. Um, so maybe the most basic example is just um, bounded error probabilistic polynomial time. So there's some kind of a promise that the randomized algorithm produces the right answer with high probability. So typically you see classes that have some randomness involved, or maybe you could have a version of NP that guarantees a unique witness. Why do I have a unique witness? Well, that's sort of a promise, it's a semantic promise. Also, if you look at intersections or syntactic classes, it could still result in a, in a semantic class. Okay, so this is a big divide uh, amongst the classes we study. And it is a kind of a machine for pro producing conjectures in concrete complexity. Is, you know, suppose I look at a semantic model, one of these um, promise models, but I asked it to solve a total problem. Somehow, you know, you could, it seems like you can't really use the power of this uh, semantic promise if you're, the problem I'm asking you to solve is total. That, that's sort of the intuition. And let, let me just show you this um, uh, interplay, kind of uh, a few examples. Um, so here I have at the top a semantic class, at the bottom a syntactic class. In fact, I've chosen the highest class for a semantic class, I choose the highest uh, subset that's uh, a syntactic class. And I generally conjecture that if you look at now, you know, the query complexity analogs in the class of total Boolean functions, okay, so this was characterized by randomized decision trees. But if I ask it to compute a complete problem, you should, the power of the model should somehow collapse down to the syntactic uh, class. So in this very example, it's, this is a you know, classic, uh, I shouldn't say fault law, but like classic result in query complexity. Uh, if a randomized decision tree is also a total Boolean function, can actually convert it into a deterministic um, decision tree. So, okay, maybe there's some loss in, polynomial loss in the height of the tree, but um, that's allowed. So here's the, <laughs> the Framework sort of in action. We have theorems like this. Sorry, uh, Mikhail. Yeah. That's up, right? I mean, the one that you showed, that would be sure. from Nissan's classic. Uh, yeah, I suppose I was too lazy to track down the references. Yeah, it's, it's unfair to say it's folklore. Uh, here's another one. So I, I look at uh, NP versus problem, semantic class. I think the highest subclass that's syntactic. The conjecture is that for total Boolean functions, this should be a collapse. So uh, in this case, it's known. Like if you, if you have a Boolean function that I can write it both as a KDNF and a KCNF, so if there are short certificates for both one and zero inputs, well, then you actually do can construct um, a shallow decision tree uh, for the function. Okay. So I mean, I teach this in my to my master students in my complexity class. But, okay, so these are known results, but like we can look at any pair of semantic syntactic classes. So let me take this and kind of ask the analogous question one level higher up. 
So <coughs> what if I look at the intersection of the, the second level of the polynomial hierarchy? What would be a subclass of this that's syntactic and sort of the highest uh, syntactic <coughs> class you can come up with? Say again? P to the NP. P to the NP is correct. So, I mean, you could go and <laughs> look at the complexity diagram to know the highest uh, um, syntactic class you can find. Okay, so what does this, this pattern mean? It, suppose I have a total boolean function and both <coughs> that function and its complement admit a small depth three uh, circuit. So, or at the top, and I, I suppose polylog padding at the bottom. So again, now there's a new conjecture. If you're computing a total Boolean function, it should collapse. So th that function should admit also an efficient what? What, what is the got a circuit analog of P to the NP? Wonder if people know this. Sorry, say again. Decision lists. That's, <laughs> that's right. Decision lists. Um, so this is wide open. Uh, and in some sense, it's a win-win situation. So uh, you, you can prove this, and that sort of cohesively meshes with our intuitions. But maybe you could surprise me and show this fails. This fails because you can identify <coughs> a total Boolean function you can compute here efficiently, but not here. Well, that would give you a new complexity class. A new syntactic complexity class whose complete problem is the counterexample to this you found. So you win either way. Um, so this is a fun game. We can do a little bit more. So here I've picked uh, as my semantic class Arthur Merlin and the syntactic NP. So what are the query complexity analogs? Um, uh, I suppose here is just a randomized DNF, so probability distribution of the DNFs and on some input to sample a DNF and uh, um, it, the DNF should give you the right answer with high probability. So my conjecture is that if you have such an object and you're computing a total Boolean function, well, you should just collapse again um, down to just, a, in this case, a DNF. Um, it's wide open. Uh, in fact, exploring, connecting something that I said before, uh, you could, a weaker, Collapse would be you could start with something in between. So there are semantic classes in between. In particular, the approximate counting problem I already mentioned. So suppose I have a total Boolean function efficiently <coughs> reducing the approximate counting. The approximate counting had the promise that there's a constant factor gap in the Hamming weight. I, I conjecture you, you can't compute anything more than just those um, functions that have small DNFs this way. Uh, your approximate counting class had this root n instead of constant n. So, is there is it relevant? So, so yeah, you have to. So the threshold should be some polynomial input length. Um, you can't have n instead of root n. That would be BBB. Uh -huh. I, I got. Okay, so maybe I have five minutes remaining. Let me browse a little bit more. Um, let's talk about actually not esoteric things, but important problems. Uh, important in the sense that Tony would use the word. Um, so, <laughs> so this is you know right at the kind of the top of my list. Uh, there are a bunch of hard-looking problems. I pick three here, which I call the holy trinity. So these are asking to prove uh, DAG-like lower bounds, uh, which I think we might now have a good um, chance for because of these new lifting theorems. In fact, the first question is, you know, prove a better lifting theorem with a gadget that's smaller than is known. Like currently we have it for index gadget, not for inner product. As an application, it would have interesting uh, consequences for, um, like a breakthrough consequence for um, proving lower bounds for resolution. And then at least in the proof of exit workshop last week, we heard a lot about like Reslin because people are uh, um, like actively working on it. Or then the old problem of proving monotone circuit complexity, lower bounds for matching, Ras probably proved quasi polynomial, should be exponential. So there are important problems, but I, what I like about them is that I think I've tried all of them several years ago. 
And I feel like I get stuck because of the same reason in all of the uh, problems. So I feel like if you solve one, maybe you solve all of them. Uh, that's putting it optimistically. Um, so let me just, this is only for the experts, people who have worked with, worked on lifting theorems, but let me sort of explain why I get stuck when I uh, try to prove these dag like lower bounds. Um, so we had this uh, dag like lifting theorem for uh, the index gadget. And the way all these lifting theorems work is you work in, uh, you study communication protocols and you want to analyze some rectangles in the uh, communication matrix. So you have some set of Alice's inputs, some set of Bob's inputs, and you want to understand why is this rectangle sort of query like. Um, and what we do is we say, okay, large rectangles may, may not be query like, but you can partition them into pieces. Each piece is query like. And for the index gadget, we have a two round protocol. So Alice first partitions her set, and then Bob partitions each of the remaining pieces a bit further. And we have this like the main lemma in these lifting theorems is that you get a partition where most of the pieces are query like the, what you want, but okay. Some pieces maybe become too small and they're deemed error. And the, the crux, like why these dag like lifting theorem currently work, is that all the error pieces, well, they're small, but moreover, they're easy to ignore because they are contained in only few um, rows or few columns. So if I want to kind of delete my error pieces, I just ignore those two um, rows and columns and I still like in a rectangular region. So this is what we did with, I guess, uh, uh, well, Dimitri is here. Well, Tony has proved uh, lifting theorems for tree-like models using the inner product gadget. So what happens there? Why can't we do this in the dang-like case? Well, the way I see it is now the partitioning algorithm is more complicated. It's not too round. Alice has to do some partition. Bob has to do partition. And they go back and forth. Uh, so the partition is a bit more complicated you still have the property that at the end, most pieces are query-like, but there's some error pieces you have to ignore. Uh, and those error pieces, they're small uh, in measure, but as I've kind of drawn here, the problem is that they no longer contain in few rows and columns. So they, the error set could like form this kind of block diagonal uh, structure. And even though their measure is small, I don't know how to ignore them in the argument. I can't like get rid of them by deleting few rows and columns. And um, I think this is the issue in all of the three problems. Um, uh, like even for matching, you can sort of do a multi-round partitioning algorithm. This is the issue. Um, so uh, yeah, you can, you can talk to me uh, about these things uh, afterwards. Uh, but I, I really feel like I'm, I'm too old for this already. So I, <laughs> I like to give these out for like the new young generation. Maybe the vision has to continue onwards. Um, so new young people or young energetic old people uh, like Tony. <laughs> Happy birthday, Tony. Thank you. Uh, it's great. Uh, questions? Comments? Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Um, so in the quantum setting, it's also known that for total functions, quantum query complexity and deterministic decision tree complexity are polynomially related. So do you also have any conjectures in the quantum setting? So that's true. It's one of those like uh, PQP is a semantic class. So it kind of should, for total functions, it should collapse to P and it does in, in query settings. Um, so that's sort of, you know, for my framework, that question is settled. I guess you could look at other quantum models to generate new conjectures. So there are these like quantum analogs of NP, like QMA. Uh, and yeah, you can ask like, you know, what, what is the analogous query model and how does it behave for total functions? I haven't looked at that. So there's a nice theory of complexity measures uh, that captures the um, low complexity classes. Do you think there's a corresponding complexity theories for yeah. higher uh, classes? So I guess our like methods to prove lower bounds start failing around P space because the query or circuit analog of P space is uh, polynomial size formulas. 
And okay, we can't prove lower bounds for them. I'm all about proving unconditional lower bounds. So my kind of tools stop there. Um, and you know, you, you would have to ask other questions about them besides like proving unconditional lower bounds. Other questions? Anybody remote? Oh, thank Mika again. Okay, thank you.